What we're going to do in this session is to deal with what I call the, the problem passages that are always raised when you start dealing with postmillennialism. Um, and it's, it's they're, they're, they're the typical ones, more on the premillennial side than the all millennial side. And, uh, it, and it's not that I want to slight all millennialism, uh, it's just that the majority of of what you read out there is from the premillennial side and not a whole lot. I don't even know when the, the, the I think there have only been a couple of all mill books that have been written in the last, last few years. So let's go. The first place we want to go is Ezekiel 37 and 39 through, through 39. Ezekiel 37. And again, I'm only going to touch on these things, on, on these briefly. I've dealt with Ezekiel 38 and 39 in a, in a book um, that I wrote called The Gog and Magog End Time Alliance. Uh, if you're interested in the more details of all this, I go through both of these, Ezekiel 38 and 39, in, in quite a bit of detail. Uh, but I'm just going to touch on a few things here. Ezekiel 37, this is the dry bones that, that come to life again. And uh, what we generally find in popular eschatology is that this is Israel becoming a nation again in the distant future, uh, which is kind of amazing because then it skips over the return from exile and also skips over the, the first century with Jesus where all these promises made to Israel had to be fulfilled. I mean, that's what, that's what Luke writes. That's what Zacharias writes. And that's what uh, Mary writes. And then the Paul, Paul himself says, says the, the, the same thing. So that this, this, the dry bones, the valley of dry bones, is really about the return of the, the Jewish exiles. It fits the time period, and it fits what actually took place. Then you get to, ver you get to chapters 38 and 39. Um, this comes up all the time. Many, many books have been, been written, written on, on this prophecy. It's a big end-time prophecy, two chapters. And I'm just going to read the first couple of verses of chapter 38. And I'm going to read it two different ways. And I, I'm, I'm curious as to what your translation has. So Ezekiel chapter 38. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face towards Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against them. Now I'm going to read it a different way. Son of man, set your face towards Gog, the land of uh, Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, I'm going to ask you, who has a translation that has prince of Rosh? The second verse, Ezekiel 38, who has the prince of Rosh? Okay, who doesn't have the prince of Rosh? Okay, interesting. Now, why? Because the Hebrew word rosh in Scripture, and it's used like 600 times, it almost always means head or chief. If you were to look at the podium that, that uh, Bibi Netanyahu stands behind, you will see in Hebrew it says, it uses the Hebrew word rosh because he's the head guy. It simply means chief or head. Rosh Hashanah, one of the highest holy days. It's the head holy day. Well, what has happened with a lot of, a lot of uh, prophetic speculation is they have turned this into a place. And that's why some translations have the prince of Rosh taking the, the very common Hebrew word Rosh and turning it into a place. And that place has been Russia because Rosh sounds like Russia. This is not how you do biblical exegesis, let me tell you. Um, there's words that sound alike, there are all kinds of words in Hebrew, and that's one of the most difficult parts about learning Hebrew is there are very few Hebrew words that sound anything like, uh, like English. Yet you study Greek, there are all kinds of Greek words that sound a lot like English. Uh, in Latin as well, but not Hebrew. So trying to memorize words 
in Hebrew was difficult. You had to kind of make up little sayings and so forth. I wrote a book called Memory Mechanics where I go through and show you how to help, help you memorize Hebrew, Hebrew words. But the Hebrew word rosh simply means it's, this guy is, whoever this guy is, he's the chief, he's the, 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 the chief um, prince of Meshach and so forth. Now the question is, who is that? Um, this is not unique to me, but it's not original to me as well, is that a, a good friend of mine, a fantastic Bible uh, a scholar, anytime I ever got stuck on a Bible passage, I would always, I would always call Jim up and say, Jim, give me some insight into this. And he would always, he would always just, Gary, you need to look at this, 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 and this, and this. This was a guy who used the Bible to interpret the Bible over and over and over again. Um, and I didn't call some of my other friends, I, called, I would call Jim. And he, he went through and did a study of this, and he says that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is actually describing what takes place in the book of Esther. And if you go through the book of Esther, what is Haman trying to do? He's trying to kill all the Jews that are throughout the 127 provinces. And that's what this is all about. And I want you to notice a couple of other things here. Look at verse 4. And I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you out in all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly um, attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. Now, remember, dispensationalists say we need to interpret the Bible literally, but they don't interpret this literally. In fact, one particular writer says, well, horses here actually means horsepower. Yeah. And so that's how we should interpret this. And um, bows and arrows in another place are, were, were considered uh, missiles and missile launchers. And then you have chariots, where of course were tanks. But if you, if you interpret this literally, that is according to the literature, and stick with that, this is an ancient battle that that took place centuries and centuries ago. And it fits very, very well with the, the book of Esther. In fact, you will find in here, um, I don't know if I can find it, actually Haman is mentioned in here and he is described as Haman Gog. And a Gog in, in the literature is a Gogite, is an Agagite. He's the, he's the last Agagite. Remember the curse that was on the Agagites. They would be wiped out all their generations. Well, Haman is the last one, and he, he is mentioned here in that respect. And I want you to look at one other thing here. I want you to look at verse 13 of Ezekiel chapter 38. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all its villages will say to you, Have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to capture great spoil? So what are they after? Gold, silver, cattle, and goods. Those are the four things they're after. And what have the literalists done? They're after, it used to be a long, long time ago, it was supposedly potash. They were going to get potash, I guess, out of the Dead Sea. Uh, then it became oil, that what was going to happen is, is that all around Israel, everybody else had discovered oil, but Israel was going to finally discover oil, and it's going to make them uh, the powerhouse of, of, of the world, and then Russia and a 200 million man Chinese army is going to come down and take over, take over Israel. The problem with that is, we are told, and if you look at the, the, the book of Ezra, this is, I'm telling you, this is my approach. Use scripture to interpret scripture. So what did the exiles bring back from the exile? Very much like what took place when they came out of Egypt. They brought back the spoils of the captivity back with them. And I want you to, I'm going to read what they brought back. Verse 4 is Ezra chapter 1. And every survivor, whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So what did they bring back? Gold, silver, cattle, and goods. The very thing that Haman was after when he, by spoiling the Jews. It's kind of like Adolf Hitler. What did Adolf Hitler do to the Jews? 
He literally stole the gold out of their teeth. And there's a, there's a movie called the, the, uh, the, Woman, the Woman in Gold. If you haven't seen it, it's a very, very good movie. It's based on a true story about a woman uh, who she grew up in during the time of Nazi Germany, and they were a very prominent Jewish family, and there was a portrait, I think, of her aunt. And, of course, the Nazis came in and, and, and took it. And, of course, after the war, they, they, they found, a, a, remember the movie Monuments Men, where they went back and they tried to get all, get all this art and bring it back to the people that it originally belonged to. Well, this was, I think this was in a, um, I think it was in a Austrian museum, I think. And she hires a lawyer to help her get this, this portrait back. It's this, it was the same type of thing. This is the same thing Haman wanted to do. Haman wanted to kill all the Jews and take all the spoils, because they had brought all this stuff back you know, from, uh, from the exile. Uh, God, had, God had blessed them in bringing them back. So the, the very thing that, there, that uh, uh, Ezekiel is talking about here as to w what was valuable is the very thing they brought back. And there's much, much more to, to this particular, particular chapter. Uh, Ezekiel uh, talks about um, uh, unwalled, unwalled cities. Esther talks about unwalled cities. Unfortunately, uh, the New American Standard translates uh, the, the, per, the, the Hebrew word parazah, one way in one place and another way in another place. You don't see it in English. But all, there are numerous parallels. Uh, so Jim Jordan got me on the track, and then I went through and did it, uh, went through it in much, much detail. Now, the Gog and, Gag, uh, Gog and Magog is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 20. But notice that it appears at the end of the thousand years. And yet dispensationalists claim that this is talking about modern-day Russia because it's from the, from the north. <coughs> it comes from the north. Well, if you look at a map on Israel, almost everything comes down from the north uh, because you've got the, the Mediterranean on, on, on the west side. Uh, so that's, that's nothing unusual. But th there, there, li there lies the problem with all of this is that um, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 isn't describing something in the distant future. It's being used symbolically in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, just like Babylon is being used, Jezebel is being used, Egypt is being used, all in the same way. In Revelation chapter 11, Sodom and Egypt all of a sudden don't come up out of the ground. They're being used here because Jerusalem, the place where Jesus was crucified, that's what Revelation 11 says, was called Sodom and Egypt. And so first century Jerusalem, because it crucified the Lord of glory, is described very much like Sodom and Egypt. And also later on in chapter 17 and 18 in the book of Revelation, Babylon, the, 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 the harlot, the harlot woman, is in fact first century, first century Israel. Uh, dressed, dressed in uh, uh, high priestly garb and robes and so forth. And even with you know, the very thing that the high priest wore on on, on, on his head. Um, so Ezekiel 38 and 39 is being used symbolically in Revelation chapter 20, just like uh, uh, Sodom and Egypt and Babylon and Jezebel are, are being used as well. But again, I deal with this in much, much detail. Every, you know, I, co I cover almost everything that's, that's in this particular chapter in my, my book, The Gog and Magog End Time Alliance. Daniel 9, we already looked at. I'm not going to go over it again. Um, Daniel chapter 9 is a big, is a big uh, uh, prophetic passage that's used against post-millennialists because there's the Antichrist is supposed to be there, um, supposed to make a peace treaty with Israel and then break the peace treaty. And how can you have post-millennialism if that's the case? And, and, and by the way, if you talk to somebody about Israel, if peace breaks out in the Middle East, that's the sign of the Antichrist. If Israel is attacked in the Middle East, that's a sign of the Antichrist, too. You can't, you can't win. Um, and so I, I know when uh, President Trump was, was trying to kind of work with some of these nations that wanted to have uh, a, a um, relationship with Israel, I read online, oh, this is part of the Antichrist. You know, he's setting Israel up for a big fall in the end. Um, then let's, Zechariah 14, uh, it's one of the most complicated one of the most complicated chapters in the, in the whole Bible. I hate to even bring it up. I'm working on a, an extensive um, 
work on it. I'm just about finished with it. There are just a couple of passages that I haven't, I haven't dealt with. Um, but Zechariah 14 is very much like Ezekiel 38 and 39, with all the language in here is old world language. Um, and this idea of, look at verse 4, because this is the big one they say. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move towards the north and the other half towards the south. And they say, well, this is Jesus' second coming. They'll say um, in, in um, Acts chapter 1, Jesus will return in the same way that he left. He was on the Mount of Olives. Notice this is written in, this is in the Old Testament. It doesn't say that whoever this hymn is comes down out of heaven and stands on the Mount of Olives. What does it say? It simply says, and on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. All it says is whoever this is stands on the Mount of Olives. Did Jesus stand on the Mount of Olives? Yes, he did. In fact, and we're going to look at this in a moment, if you look at uh, Acts, um, Matthew chapter 21 through 25, where is Jesus on Matthew chapter 21 through 25? He's on the Mount of Olives. Uh, very kind of like a, a mosaic um, uh, depiction here. He's on the, he's on the mount. It's very much like, like Jesus is on the, the, the sermon on the mount. He's delivering, he's delivering these messages of, of justice, and he is on a mount. He's on the Mount of Olives. So I believe Zechariah 14 doesn't have anything to do with the distant end times. The language here is typical of an, of an ancient culture. Um, and, and, and look, I, I admit this is a very difficult passage. I've had difficulty going through it uh, my, my, myself. I was waiting for Jim Jordan uh, to do his, he was commissioned to um, do a commentary on the book of Zechariah. Uh, he never did finish it. He, he's had a, had a stroke. Um, so I don't know if we'll ever get around to finishing it. So I'm gonna have to do this all on, all on my own. I can't, I won't be able to cheat anymore. Uh, Let's look at the let's look at the uh, the Olivet discourse. I just want to mention a couple of things here. Um, and if you look at Matthew chapter twenty one, uh, Matthew twenty one, and look at verse forty five. This this sets the audience. This is this is crucial when you when you do when you study the Bible, especially something that's has a particular historical context. There are people involved, uh, and uh, the people are saying things, and there are responses to it and so forth. You have to pay attention to the audience. To whom is Jesus speaking? And if you read chapter 21, Jesus is, is, is laying out a case against Israel. Now remember, not all the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, it was probably one-third, two-thirds that, that uh, one-third embraced Jesus as the Messiah, possibly two-thirds didn't. Uh, those who didn't were uh, and stayed in Jerusalem, didn't listen to Jesus, were caught in the maelstrom of, of judgment that, that Rome brought upon them. And, and some say, Josephus says that nearly a million of them died. Um, so, but I want, you to, I want you to understand that the people to whom Jesus was uh, talking to understood that he was talking about them he was not talking about something in the distant future. Look at chapter 21, verse 45. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. That's the historical context. In fact, this is the historical context that goes through this, in this, this whole setting here from chapter 21. If you go back to chapter 21, the very beginning of it, it says, and when they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, and this is where he gets the, the donkey and so forth. And he rides in, he rides in on a donkey. And this is extremely important that he rides in on the donkey. He doesn't come in on a horse, which would be a, a physical conqueror. He comes in on a donkey, which now in our day we would say a lowly donkey, but that was the very nature of kingship. You were a king, but at the same time, you were 
you were to be a servant of the people, so you're now on a donkey. So Jesus comes into the donkey. And the people of Israel knew, knew uh, what, what was going on here. They're the ones that laid the olive branches down in front of him. So the, all, all of this is extremely important to understand uh, what's, what's going on here. If you look at chapter 22, um, it talks about the parable of the marriage feast uh, and uh, the rejection the rejection that takes place, and if you look at verse 7 of chapter Matthew 22, but the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. I believe here he's talking about unbelieving Israel. Get therefore to the main highways and, in many, and, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Now, why the main highways? Because these were the travel routes of merchants who were coming into Israel and to trade and going all the way down into Egypt. So these were, these were non-Jews who were being called into the kingdom. And so this is what you find throughout the book of Acts. You also find this in the book of Ephesians, where the dividing law is broken, broken down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the... the, the the nations are grafted into an already existing Jewish church as promised. A Jewish, I don't even like to use the word church. A Jewish ecclesia, which is a, the Greek word for church, uh, which William Tyndale translated as congregation. That's why when you get to Acts chapter 7, when, when, when uh, Stephen is um, recounting the history, redemptive history of Israel, he talks about the ecclesia in the wilderness. The King James translates that as the church in the wilderness. But the better translation, instead of church, is, is congregation. And uh, Tyndale ended up being burned at the stake because he refused to translate ecclesia as church and instead translated it as the congregation, which is the better translation. That's another topic for another day. So then we get to the get end of chapter 23. Chapter 23 is an indictment upon unbelieving, unbelieving Israel. And then if you get to verse 36, it says, Truly I say to you, this, that's audience reference is important here. Truly I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Now, definition of this generation is extremely important because every time, every time the phrase this generation is used, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, especially in the Gospels, it always refers to the generation to whom Jesus is speaking. It's not describing a future generation. And it's, it, amaz, it amazes me when we get to chapter 24, the, um, the hoops that people will jump through in order to get the Bible to say something it doesn't say. Then verse 37 of chapter 23. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. No chapter divisions in the original manuscripts. We go right into what is now we call chapter 24. And Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when the disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. So, see, this is, this is, the, this is a transition that's an immediate transition. Jesus goes from the temple. So what house is being left to them desolate? It's the temple. This is why the disciples, um, you know, asked this question, you know, and Jesus came, came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he answered and said to them, because they, they knew exactly what Jesus was talking about when he talked about your house is being left to you desolate. You mean this temple? And what was, what was going on with that temple? It was being rebuilt. Remember, if you go to John chapter 2, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it back up again. They were thinking about the physical temple, but Jesus was describing the temple of his own body. And finally, the, the Herodian temple uh, was finished in around the mid-60s. The mid and then was destroyed a couple of years later when the Romans came in. And he answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. He's talking about that temple. He's not talking about a rebuilt temple. He's talking about that temple. And again, I'm not going to go through this chapter. I've already dealt with 
that chapter in Last Day's Madness and the, my book Wars and Rumors of Wars, which is a verse by ver <coughs> verse by verse exposition of Matthew parts of Matthew 23 and, and Matthew 24. But I just want to point out a couple of things in here. Um, verse six, you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. There were wars and rumors of wars throughout the the Mediterranean area at that uh, area uh, at that particular period of time. Remember. Um, Rome was an empire of nations, and they were always warring against one another, against the Romans. I mean, you, had, you even had in Israel, you had the zealots who were at war with, with Israel, and finally it, that all came to an end uh, at, at Masada in AD 73 when there was a standoff with the Romans. So there were always wars and rumors of wars going on. Uh, nation will rise against nation, that's no big deal. Famines and earthquakes, in fact, if you look at Acts chapter 11, there was a famine that was supposed to take place throughout the whole Roman Empire. And that's in the Bible, that's his, that is Acts chapter 11. It doesn't say there will be more earthquakes than ever happened before, or there'll be bigger earthquakes. All it says is there, there will be earthquakes. And were there earthquakes? You bet there were. In fact, in history, history tells us there was huge, huge earthquake in Pompeii. If you go over there today, you'll see a volcano is, in fact, an earthquake. But there were many, many earthquakes in, in that, that period of time. At the time of Jesus on the cross, there was an earthquake. An earthquake uh, came about when um, Peter was, was freed, f freed from, from um, prison. So there's nothing unusual about earthquakes. Look at verse 14. This always stumps people. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations. And then the end shall come. They say, this, this hasn't happened yet. But when this happens, Jesus is going to return. Friends, this has happened. And how do we know that this has happened? Verse 14 has already been fulfilled. Jesus said in verse 34, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And that includes verse 14. And I'm going to be quick about this. It says, The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world. I want you to look at your Bibles and see if there is a note where it says, if yours says whole world, is there a note in the margin? If yours doesn't say whole world, what does it say? Who has something other than whole world? Nobody? Is there anything in the margin that says anything? When, is there a little one there that takes you to the margin and asks, tells you what it might be? This, this is one of my frustrations with so-called literal translations. The literal translation of this, the Greek word there translated for world, you would think would be cosmos, for God so loved the cosmos. But that's not the Greek word here. The Greek word is oikumene, and it's the only time Matthew uses it. Now, Christmas time, I remember this, that remember that when I was a really, really young, back in the 1950s, and watching that black and white TV and that Christmas story with uh, 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 an animation and, and uh, Alexander Scorby reading Luke chapter 2 verse 1 that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be taxed. Did Caesar Augustus tax the entire world? Now he would have liked to but he didn't. Because the Greek word that's used in Luke 2.1, if you look at your translation of Luke 2.1, I bet you the word world isn't in most of your translations. It'll say inhabited earth, and it says, or, the, or that is the Roman Empire. The Greek word there is oikumene. It's the same Greek word that's used in Matthew chapter 24.14. So, however far that tax was, that's how far the gospel had to go in order to be fulfilled. Was the gospel preached throughout the whole oikumene, throughout the whole Roman Empire, before Jesus returned? What would convince you? The only thing that should convince you is if it's in the Bible. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 8. First, I thank my God throughout, through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And there the word cosmos is used. And if you look at Romans chapter 16, Romans 16, verse uh, 25, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, 
according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. So you've got gospel is going to be preached throughout the whole oikumene for a witness to all the nations. Then if you look at Colossians, well, I'll just cite, well, I'll go, we'll go there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. Listen to this. Verse 22 talks about, and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed, this is again Colossians 1, 23, uh, indeed, if you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. So we're not, the gospel being preached in the whole world isn't an issue to bring Jesus back. What we're commanded to do as Christians, and this is part of the postmillennialism, we are to take the gospel into the existing world today, but we are to make disciples of the nations. Those who hold to this idea of just preaching the gospel in all the world, so they develop a film about Jesus, and I'm okay with that, but they feel like if they can just get the gospel to everybody in the entire world, that Jesus will return. That's not what's going on in this particular passage. This passage is dealing with events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, because we know that what is being destroyed here is the temple. And there are other, there are other passages here I could deal with. Let's look at a real, real hard one. Verse 29 and immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the land will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, uh, clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now people say, you're not, telling, you're, you're not going to tell me that that has already been fulfilled. Yes, I am. Because in verse 34, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. I had a very, uh, he's a friend now. Um, I guess he's a good friend. You would know who he is if I told you who he was, but I'm not going to tell you who he is. But he watched a series that I did on Matthew chapter 24, and he would put each DVD in, and, uh, uh, and then he would say, You know, well, I, what Gary has to say, I, I, I go along with it. A, friend of, a mutual friend of ours told him you needed to watch this. Then he got to verse 29. He says, There is no way that Gary DeMar can convince me that verse 29 had already been fulfilled. So he put it in, and after watching it, he said, I'm convinced. Because these passages are directly from the Old Testament. And those passages about sun going dark, moon, when the sun goes dark, the moon goes dark, and stars falling from, from heaven, those are Old Testament language which are used against nations of that particular period of time. And what Jesus does, he brings them into the New Testament and applies them to first century Israel. And sure enough, if you, if you go to Genesis chapter 37, how is Israel uh, defined? Remember the dream that Joseph had. What was his dream? That his son, his father, his son, and his 11 brothers were bow, would, would bow down in front of him. And how are they described? Sun, moon, and stars. If you get to Revelation chapter 12, there's this woman who gives birth. How is she described? She's standing on the moon, she's clothed with the sun, and she's, and she's got 12 stars as a crown on her head. This isn't some giant woman out in space. This is a depiction of Israel. What about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven? It's a direct quotation from D Daniel chapter 7. Which way is the Son of Man going in Daniel chapter 7? He's going up to the Ancient of Days. This is the vindication of Jesus Christ, not him coming back to earth. Then we get to verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And Look, everybody who reads this for the first time, when I became a Christian for the first time, when the late great planet Earth was big, I got to this passage and I said, this seems to be saying that Jesus is saying that everything before this verse was to take place before that generation passed away. But I didn't have the faintest idea how to answer that. So I let it go for a while until I came across a book 
uh, by J. Marcellus Kick, K-I-K, and I read it, and I was, it completely changed my view. He compared Scripture with Scripture. And every time this generation is used in the Gospels, now go back, to, go back to Matthew chapter 11, chapter 12, and you will see that every time this generation is used, it refers to the generation to whom Jesus is speaking. Even in Matthew chapter 23, I had a debate with Thomas Ice on this. He even agreed with me. He agreed with me that every time this generation is used elsewhere, it refers to the generation to whom Jesus is speaking, except in Matthew chapter 24, verse 34. And so if you read the Schofield Reference Bible, they change generation to mean race. This race will not pass away until all these things take place, meaning the Jewish race. Let me read it that way to you. Truly I say to you, the Jewish race will not pass away until all these things take place. But dispensationalists will tell you it's all about Israel. But according to their reading of this, if you make this race, the, Jew, the Jewish race passes away when all these things take place. That can't happen. Another way they try to do it, say it, is uh, this type of generation will not pass away. Now you have to add a word. Another, um, Tim LaHaye and Thomas I say, the, the, the generation that sees these signs will not pass away until all these things take place. You've got to get rid of this and add a bunch of words. But look at verse 33. Even so you too, when you see all these things, recognize uh, that he or it is near right at the door. Who's he talking to? He's talking about them. That's Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. Again, I deal with that in my, in my uh, book. I want you to look, go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1. These are passages that oftentimes don't come up uh, except for somebody who, who really, really knows, knows their Bible. And they come across these passages and they say, this is a, can, you know, totally against uh, the post-millennial view. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, audience reference. Who is Paul talking about? He's talking about them. Look at verse 8. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, and not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Still talking about them. Verse 9, for they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Second person plural is used. In fact, if you read the, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, second person plural is used throughout. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Well, that they will take you and persecute you. You, 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 all the way through. Now look at verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's a path, that is something right out of uh, Matthew chapter 16, 27 through 28. There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In Matthew chapter uh, 10, you will not finish going through the, the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. This coming is a judgment coming upon, upon Israel. I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Now you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ, uh, Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you also endured the same suffering at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. This is taken right out of Matthew chapter 23. Hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles they might be, uh, so that they might be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. Again, Matthew chapter 23. We didn't read it, but it's there. But wrath has come to them to the utmost. Matthew chapter 23, verse 22. So the parallels with the Olivet Discourse are, are right there. This isn't talking about something that takes place in the distant future. Now, 
This does not mean just because this was fulfilled that God doesn't pour his wrath out. It's because of passages like this that God was definitive in what he said about his wrath, that it can't happen again. And I believe the same thing is in the book of Revelation. Why is the book of Revelation written to those seven churches? Because it's a warning to them and a warning to us that what happened to Israel can happen to us as well. It doesn't mean that we discount, we discount um, post-millennialism. This is the ebb and flow of history. It's always happened and it all, it's always going to happen. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. Um, well, let's see, look at first, 2 Thessalonians 1, see chapter, verse 1, chapter 6. Yeah, let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. And to, and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. That's from Jude chapter, uh, it was only one chapter, verses 14 and 15. And also back to Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 through 28. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord, our Lord Jesus. So again, this is... This is a judgment that's going to take place before that generation passes away. Then go to 2 Thessalonians 2. Um, I have two chapters on 2 Thessalonians 2 in my book, uh, Last Day's Madness. A lot of people think this is the, a rapture uh, passage. A lot of people believe that this, this particular chapter uh, is, is telling us that the temple is going to be rebuilt and uh, the Antichrist is going to get in the temple. I don't believe that at all. What's happen happening here uh, by some timing indicators will, will, will tell you a few things. Um, first off, it, this cannot be talking about the rapture. If this is talking about the rapture, there's a real problem because if you look at verse 2, that you, be, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from me to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now, if, the, if this was about the rapture, how would Paul have written them a letter telling them that this stuff was coming to, coming to pass or had, 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 had come to pass? He couldn't have done it. He would have been taken off the earth. So this is not about the church being taken off the earth at all. Uh, Early, if you go back to the first, first Thessalonians, you'll see that, there is, that Paul is talking about this coming judgment that Jesus is going to bring against the, the unbelieving Jews. He mentions them in particular. Um, and in verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. It's a big debate as to who the man of lawlessness was. Um, but there, we also know that the, the apostasy has to come first. What is that apostasy? Uh, if, if you read Paul's letters and even John, there were those who were among us. Paul talks about that in, a, in, a, in Acts chapter 20, that there will be, out of your own congregation, there will be wolves. Wolves will come into the church. So there was a, an apostasy uh, near the end of, the, of the, uh, the lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now look at verse 4. Whoever the man of lawlessness was, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? Uh, and, you, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So you don't need to figure out who the man of lawlessness is. And as usual, there are all kinds of candidates. Uh, some believe it was the, the high priest still, off, still offering sacrifices. Some believe it was, uh, actually, some believe it was Nero. Uh, there is an argument that uh, um, Robert Young, who uh, Young's literal translation is a very good piece on 
who the man, who he believes the man of lawlessness, and that is it's Nero. Uh, and and the, 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 the temple here is, the, the word for the temple here isn't talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem. It's talking about the, the temple being the, the kind of the church of Jesus Christ. And in fact, that is used throughout, throughout the New Testament, especially in Paul's epistles to uh, the Corinthians. But we don't need to know who it is. We just need to know when it was. And whoever the man of lawlessness was, he was being restrained in Paul's day. Now I want you to look at 2, Thess- 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is a big one that, keeps, that comes up a lot. Uh, 2 Timothy 3. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. When, are, when were the last days? Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, uh, Under the old covenant, God spoke in the, this way, but in these last days he has spoken to us through his Son. The last days here refer to the last days of the old covenant order. And, and, and Paul talks about this in, in 1 Corinthians um, Oh, I can't remember where it was. He talks about uh, uh, don't be led astray or you'll, you know, he talks about how the ends of the ages had already come. Um, so this isn't talking about the end of the world. This is talking about the last days of the old covenant. The, the last days of the old covenant, if you look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse thing, 8, 13, that was in the process to passing away. And I just read that real quick. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. When he said, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready, that is near to disappear. And with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, that did in fact took place. It, it completely disappeared. But this particular passage, if you read verses 2 through 7, people say, this describes our time period. So this must be referring to near the end of the world, when Jesus is going to, is going to return. Um, you could you outline these, and you could say that these things happen almost in every generation. And, but I want you to look, look at verse 8. Most people stop at verse 7. They're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And it says, And just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected as regards the faith. Who were Janus and Jambres? Go back to the book of Exodus, and when uh, Moses and Aaron came in out of the desert, and all that uh, Aaron had was a stick, um, and confronted Pharaoh, Janus and Jambres were the two sorcerer priests who came out and threw their staffs down that became serpents. And of course, Aaron throws his down, and what happens? It ends up consuming the other two. Those, their names aren't mentioned there. They're, I think they're mentioned in Josephus, who was a historian of that particular period of time. So, and just as, in the same way as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so, so these men, in this description from verses 2 through 7, also opposed the truth, men of depraved mind rejected as regards the faith. Now, I want you to look at the next verse. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all as also that of those came to be. And I mentioned this in the the previous talk, that secularism, atheism, progressivism, whatever you want to name it, as it becomes more and more consistent with itself, it ends up becoming destructive. And it ends up eating, they end up eating their own. And the question is, what should we be doing in in the meantime? As we, as we see this collapse taking place. And it's going to be, it could be very painful. It's been pay, painful throughout history. And it could be painful again. But what should we do in the meantime? Verse 10. But you, you, talking to Timothy, this young pastor, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Interesting. Out of them all the Lord delivered me. But not every one of them, because eventually he ends up, well, he, here he's doing this, but he ends up getting, the tradition says he, he gets beheaded. 
Rome doesn't exist anymore, and yet we still do. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But, but evil men and, and, and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, Timothy, and by application us, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the, the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then a verse almost always taken out of context, all scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. This isn't a verse just about the inspiration of scripture. It is a verse telling us that God's word is the standard by which we should evaluate the life that, that we're living today and the conditions that we're seeing today. There is nothing in this passage that talks about how the end's going to come and Antichrist is going to rise up and things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. There's none of that in here. Paul is, is, is dealing with the reality of the nature of sin, the reality of what happens when unbelievers uh, uh, become consistent with their operating assumptions and what, what we should be doing in the meantime. No matter what, what we see going on out there, what we should be doing here is continuing the things you have learned and become, and become convinced of, knowing from you have learned them, and that from childhood, this is important, this is why education is so important. We shouldn't be turning our children over to the state to educate our children. This is something that we should be doing on a daily basis. So I've only touched on, I've touched on a lot of these passages, uh, but there are, there are others as well. Um, if you want more information on this, again, I've got uh, Wars and Rumors of Wars and uh, Last Day's Madness would go into this much, in much detail. I'm sure some of the other uh, speakers are going to deal more specifically with post-millennial passages. What I wanted to do is to deal with the initial objections to post-millennialism that you find in Scripture that, that I always have repeated back to me. And once you clear the prophetic eschatological chessboard of those, then you can start building the topic of postmillennialism.